Our story today takes place at Concordia University, located in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Founded in 1974, following the merger of Loyola College and Sir George William University, Concordia is one of three universities in Quebec where English is the primary language of instruction. One afternoon of August 1992, Professor Valerie Fabricant walked into Concordia University carrying three handguns. Ninety minutes later, two of his colleagues, Matthew Douglas and Michael Hogbin, were dead, and another two, Jan Saber and Foivo Sayogas, were mortally wounded, eventually succumbing to their wounds. Those four killings were not the first sign that Fabricant was a violent, troubled man. They were the culmination of a long history of aggression and manipulation that dated back to the days when he lived in the Soviet Union. And they occurred in spite of the fact that many at Concordia loathed and feared him because of his threats and abusive behavior. This is the story of Valerie Fabricant and the Concordia University Massacre. Valerie Fabricant was born in Minsk, Belarus on January 28, 1940 and came from a military family. His father was Lieutenant Colonel Isaac Fabricant and his mother Pesa Yudelovina was a housewife. When the Nazis invaded Russia during World War II, the family was sent 3,700 kilometers southeast to Kokoyanga near the Chinese border. After the war, the Fabricants moved to Ivanovo, a dreary textile city 233 kilometers northeast of Moscow. Valery Fabricant's school records show that he excelled in school, graduating university with honors. At the Ivanovo Power Institute, he wrote three research papers, and on the strength of these papers alone, was accepted into the Moscow Power Institute into its graduate program, without the requirement of an entrance exam. He studied under one of Russia's most foremost engineers, V.V. Bolotin, a name he would later use to help him get a job at Concordia. Years later, T.S. Sanker, the chairman of the Mechanical Engineering Department at Concordia, and the man who hired Valerie Fabricant met Bulletin, who didn't give him a glowing reference. He said he was a decent researcher, but a troublemaker. Sanker took this with a grain of salt, thinking that Bulletin was just saying this because he had to toe the Soviet government line, when in reality, Bulletin was being dead honest. Valerie Fabricant graduated in 1966 with honors, and after that, this is where the trouble began. At this point, he's now 26 years old and unable to find a job in Moscow. Fabricant was forced to seek employment in the boondocks of Russia Academia. He traveled 200 kilometers north to Rybinsk, where he took a minor teaching position at the Institute of Aircraft Technology. Two years later, for some unknown reason, he was demoted to an analyst role where he would stay for only one year. He would leave that role to take a job as an instructor in theoretical mechanics, at the Polytechnic Institute at Ilyanovsk. According to his records, he was considered a gifted scientist. And two years later, in 1972, he was promoted to assistant professor. But that didn't last long. Suddenly, in 1973, he quit. His records show, quote, he left of his own volition. But, as later events would prove, this would be a euphemism for being fired. After this role, his career continued to nosedive. In what was considered a death blow to the career of a Soviet scientist, he moved from the world of academia to a light industry and returned to his hometown of Ivanovo, taking a job as a research scientist at the Automatic Control System Institute, which employed about 1,500 people conducting research for the textile industry. His first boss was a man named Effen Scheinberg, who quickly became Fabricant's arch enemy. It didn't take long before Fabricant started accusing Scheinberg of stealing his scientific ideas. A long-term work battle ensued and was finally settled in Scheinberg's favor, in the Institute Comrades Court. This was sort of an in-house procedure to settle workers' disputes. According to court records and witnesses, the proceedings became legendary because at some point Fabricant attacked Scheinberg and tried to club him with a chair. After that incident, Fabricant was transferred to a different division, run by a man named Vadim Lividanov. He remembered Fabricant as a belligerent person who picked fights with everybody. 
He would quickly lose his temper and would hurl things like books when he got angry. Apparently, there was always a constant tension in the workplace. He also called Fabricant a fraud and said he was not a good scientist. Igor Lyakishev, who ran Fabricant's division at the Ivanovo Institute, characterized Fabricant as an unreliable person and dismissed him as dishonorable. He also said he could never admit to a mistake. Ivanovo Institute records show that Fabricant complained to the KGB and regional and central committees about colleagues conspiring against him. Fabricant even harassed the medical staff at a local clinic. He was determined to have children, and when repeated attempts failed, he went to a local clinic to have his sperm tested. Galina Osakina, an Ivanovo doctor, said that he became belligerent after receiving the results of his sperm tests, saying that the doctor's work was improper, and also brought in medical textbooks to the clinic to try and teach the staff how to run the sperm test. In 1978, Fabricant's job came up for renewal. These hearings are normally a routine process, where about 15 colleagues vote to renew a scientist's contract. Fabricant's hearing inspired a sort of cabal against him, and leading scientists at the Ivanovo Institute colluded to vote him out, mainly because of his threatening behavior, not because of his ability as a scientist. He would be offered a lesser position as a senior engineer. But Fabricant refused and launched a lawsuit saying he was being persecuted because he was Jewish. However, what eventually sank Fabricant was the evidence of his previous job performances, which showed an uninterrupted pattern of abusive belligerent behavior. Fabricant lost his case and would be fired from the Ivanovo Institute. Because of his disastrous work history, he was unable to find a job, so for the first time began considering emigrating to the West. Soviet law required that he first had to obtain an invitation from a relative in the West. He would turn to a Moscow scientist named Efim Vak to help him do this. Back in the 70s, getting approval for an exit visa to leave the Soviet Union wasn't easy, nor was it fast. It was a long process, and more often than not, most applications for exit visas were rejected. But Fabricant was different. The Soviets were so eager to get rid of him that the KGB took the unusual step of sending a courier to Fabricant's home and demanding that he sign a form proving that he received the invitations. Weirdly enough, Fabricant refused, telling the KGB he changed his mind and wanted to stay in the Soviet Union. He was basically told he didn't have a choice and had to leave the country, because without a job, life in the Soviet Union would be harsh. Fabricant took the hint and signed the forms and made plans to leave, making Canada his country of choice. The situation would be quite comical if things didn't end so tragically for his co-workers years later. Back in the day, it was possible, but not easy, to defect from the Soviet Union. And those who did were usually higher profile artists, athletes, and even members of the military. For the average person in the Soviet Union, defection took a lot of time and planning because getting caught usually meant a death sentence. In Fabricant's case, the Soviets couldn't wait to get rid of him. Valerie Fabricant was married when he lived in the USSR to a woman named Galena, who was 15 years younger than him and idolized him, supporting him through his numerous battles with Soviet academia. He insisted that his colleagues plotted against him because they feared his genius. She stuck with him from job to job, but when he decided to immigrate to Canada, he divorced her, allegedly because she was unable to have children. He would later tell friends that he chose Canada because the U.S. and Israel were too violent. Six months after Fabricant left Russia, he wrote home to Galena to inform her he was working as a professor at a Canadian university and was making $10,000 a month. But in reality, he was only making $7,000 a year as a research assistant. One day in December of 1979, an awkward man walked into the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Montreal's Concordia University. He introduced himself as Valerie Fabricant and stated, quote, I'm a scientist who escaped the Soviet Union. He then asked to see the chair of the department about applying for a position. Fabricant was informed that it was university policy to not conduct job interviews without first scheduling an appointment 
or checking the applicant's background. He returned every day until the chair of mechanical engineering finally agreed to speak with him. Sitting down with T.S. Sanker, the chairman of the mechanical engineering department, Fabricant explained that he was a Jewish descendant from Minsk who fled the Soviet Union, where he had once been an associate professor and the author of numerous scientific publications. And also, he had been the student of a professor whom Sankar profoundly respected. By the end of the interview, Sankar was impressed enough to offer Fabricant a $7,000 per year role as his research assistant. But if he had bothered to check Fabricant's credentials or references, he might have thought twice about hiring him. Though Fabricant's record in academia was exceptional, he lied about being a political refugee. A little digging into his background would have shown that he had been fired from numerous positions in the USSR due to behavior misconduct. Sankar actually expected Fabricon to turn down the offer. He was overqualified for the role and could make more money washing dishes. But Fabricon jumped on the offer. He got what he wanted, a foot in the door. Fabricon had arrived in Montreal with a list of life goals to achieve. To find a job, find a wife, and have two children, a boy and a girl. And gain recognition in modern mathematics. But he would pick up in Montreal exactly where he left off in the Soviet Union. He would threaten and fight with colleagues at Concordia and elsewhere, making enemies wherever he went. It didn't take very long for Sankar to discover the real Valerie Fabricant. But although Fabricant was problematic and didn't always do what he was asked to do, Sankar continued to work with him. Meanwhile, Fabricant was busy trying to solve a series of other problems of a different kind. Before Fabricant left the USSR, his father died, leaving him a modest amount of money. But Soviet officials refused to allow Fabricant to take it out of the country. Once he was in Canada, though, he wrote to the External Affairs Department, demanding that Canada suspend grain shipments to the USSR until he received his money. Here was a man who seriously believed that he could single-handedly disrupt trade between Canada and the Soviet Union in order to speed up the transfer of his inheritance. This was merely the beginning of Valerie Fabricant's deadly delusions. This was also around the same time he started looking for a new wife, but just came across as desperate, which he was. He struck out with Soviet Jewish women in Montreal and even ran personal ads in Russian newspapers in New York, lying about his age, claiming he was 35 when he was actually 40. Eventually, he met a much younger woman through a friend's wife who lived in Brooklyn. They were quickly married and would have two children together. At this point, two of his four goals had been achieved, but he was still pursuing a permanent job and worldwide recognition. Pathological tendencies began to show in Fabricant's character, and it wasn't long before Concordia started to hear disturbing things. In the beginning, his behavior just seemed to be annoying and could be attributed to the eccentricities of a slightly obsessive professor. For example, after signing up for French classes in 1981, Fabricant denounced the teacher because she smoked in class. It sounds strange now, but back in the 80s, people smoked everywhere. I have memories of my father smoking on a plane. He wrote the university administration demanding she'd be fired. But this was only one small incident in a long list of many. Soon, his reputation for unrelenting anger at people he believed wronged him spread to other universities. He was clearly fixated. When a University of Calgary professor, Peter Glockner, ran up against him in 1981, he came away convinced that Fabricant had mental problems. Fabricant had applied for a job at the University of Calgary and didn't even make the shortlist. And his rejection letter came from Glockner. Quote, he apparently took this very personally, because shortly after I met him at a conference in Moncton, he buttonholed me and told me it was a rude, impersonal way of communicating a negative decision. The area he was active was not the area we were making the appointment. He wouldn't accept that. He was furious. He felt that he was the best candidate for the job. But what would happen next would be legendary in Canadian mechanical engineering circles. Fabricant attended a Glockner lecture. Before it began, Fabricant grew agitated, pacing around the room. 
making loud, rude remarks and badgering officials to begin the session. He was pumped up and ready for a fight. When Glockner began his presentation, Fabricant immediately began attacking everything he said, calling him a disgrace and urging him to resign. And this abusive behavior towards Glockner happened again at a social function, with Fabricant again shouting at Glockner as people sipped away at their drinks. Back in Montreal, Fabricant bragged about his behavior. He was actually proud of himself. Fellow colleagues were puzzled by his behavior. If he was trying to get a job, this was the wrong way to go about it. Between 1982 and 1989, Fabricant published 56 papers. In 37 of these papers, he would be the only author. This low level of collaboration is unusual in engineering, where a collaboration of different skills is needed and expected. Prior to their publication, reviewers edit the papers for possible errors and omissions, and their identities are kept anonymous. In Fabricant's case, reviewers sometimes found his ideas obscure and questioned why the papers were even being published. One reviewer criticized Fabricant for claiming that a mathematical technique was original, when in fact it had been employed in 1881. And another criticized him for using scientific references that were hopelessly out of date. And another reviewer found that a problem Fabricant was claiming to have solved was solved by another researcher in 1961. These criticisms enraged Fabricant, and he demanded to know the identity of the reviewers. And when the editor refused to release the names, Fabricant flew into another rage. Tia Sanker was repeatedly taking calls from angry, offended editors who complained about Fabricant's rude and abusive behavior, but he never did anything about it. Fabricant later published two monograph books, which were compilations of his own previously published works. In the academic world, his first book, published in 1989, sold well. The second one, published in 1991, not so much. But ironically, interest in Fabricant's books grew only after the Concordia murders. As Fabricant became a professional outcast, he shunned the mechanical engineering department social activities and kept a low profile in Montreal's Soviet's Jewish community. Basically, he was a friendless loner. His life revolved around work and his family, which would be fine if he wasn't so abusive. Fabricant continually looked for research and teaching positions at other universities, but had no success. To help him out, Sanker arranged in 1982 for Fabricant to obtain an honorary title of research assistant professor. Although he did this under protest from senior Concordia administrators, who complained that Fabricant behaved so badly he didn't deserve it. Fabricant also told his colleagues at Concordia that he was offered jobs at Université de Quebec at Trois-Rivières, my French is appalling, I apologize, and Trent University in Peterborough, but rejected them both because he did not want to go to the boonies. But officials at those universities made extensive checks and found no records of Fabricant being offered temporary or permanent jobs. He also applied and was turned down for a job at the University of British Columbia. By 1990, Fabricant was desperate for a permanent job. A woman named Rose Shinen was in charge of all faculty hiring at Concordia University. So of course, Fabricant targeted her. He first sent an emissary named Grendon Hayes to meet with Rose. Emissaries worked as sort of a resident middleman in faculty disputes. Not really taking sides, not really mediating, just sort of a non-emotional professional ear. In an internal memo, Grendon Haynes once described his job, quote, facilitating the resolving of destructive and dysfunctional conflict in the university. Haynes had already met with Fabricant four times previously in 1989. And during these meetings, Fabricant had claimed he had a gun and intended to kill Concordia Rector Patrick Keneff, Engineering Dean Swami, Mechanical Engineering Professor T.S. Sanker, and several others. Haynes made sure they were warned and the university hired security to cover their homes and to follow Fabricant. This lasted several weeks before the guards were pulled off. The police were notified, but no formal complaints were ever launched. 
a psychiatrist at Montreal General Hospital, Dr. Warren Steiner, was also contacted. He advised that the university should tell Fabricant to stop threatening violence and to seek professional help. The crazy don't know that they're crazy. So the university did, but nothing more was done. In January of 1990, Grendon Haynes continued in his role as the in-house dysfunctional conflict resolver. He walked into Rose Shinen's office with a message from Fabricon. Quote, If you don't do what I tell you to do, you're going to get the same treatment as everybody else. That was a real message. From an individual who wanted a job promotion. Why they didn't fire him on the spot is beyond me. Rose had worked in academia for 41 years. So over the years, she had seen and heard it all. But to hear this message was truly bizarre saying that she had never experienced anything like it in her life. By now, Fabricant was 50 and had a wife and two children. And Concordia was the only place where he had his foot in the door. However, no full-time positions had opened up at Concordia. Since 1979, Fabricant had depended mostly on money from research grants. In 1990, however, the Quebec Education Department considered transforming the temporary research program called Action Structurant into permanent faculty positions, allowing Concordia to hire three more engineering professors. And Fabricant desperately wanted one of these jobs. He had already begged Chairman Osman for the job, occasionally bringing in his four-year-old daughter to Osman's office while he negotiated contract renewals. Osman recalled Fabricant pleading, quote, I have a family. I'm not going to let my children starve. If I don't get the reappointment, I'm going to solve it the American way. He then apparently made a gesture as if he was firing a machine gun. Again, why wasn't this man fired? They had many opportunities to do so. Osmond didn't take him seriously and even promised him a letter of recommendation, although he couldn't show it to Fabricant because doing so would violate regulations. But this wasn't good enough for Fabricant. He wanted it in writing and he wanted it now. And he felt that Rose Shinen was blocking his way. Fabricant began calling her daily making demands and hanging around her office. In menacing voices, he would ask secretaries about Rose's health, saying, how do you know she's okay if you don't know where she is? Okay, that's creepy. During this time, Fabricant took steps to obtain a gun permit. He showed up at Sûreté du Québec, June 15, 1990, to ask for a certificate to buy a pistol. Then on September 7th, he requested a permit for a 38 Beretta to protect his home. Fortunately, the SQ refused because he couldn't justify the need. After putting up with Fabricant's unrelenting harassment for nine months, Rose arrived home one evening in October to discover messages from him on her answering machine. Quote, you know who I am and you know what's going to happen. That was it. In October of 1990, Rose wrote to Fabricant telling him that if he didn't stop the harassment, she would contact the police. She didn't hear from him directly again until the fall of 1991. In the meantime, Fabricant's personnel file at Concordia was expanding, to say the least. From 1979 to 1988, his file had 28 documents, most of them routine. Noticeably absent, though, was his proof of academic records. But from 1988 to 1992, another 610 documents were filed. Most of these were complaints launched by Fabricant. He abused secretaries, technicians, and other faculty members alike, calling them scum, shams, and frauds. In January of 1990, he told Catherine McKenzie, the associate vice rector in charge of security, quote, Now I know that the way to get things done is to get a gun and shoot a lot of people. This statement came several weeks after Mark Le Pen murdered 14 women at the Université de Montréal. In one of his more infamous antics, he went after Concordia's purchasing manager, Mike Stefano. When Stefano demanded Fabricant pay for a laser printer that he ordered at the cost of $8,400, Fabricant threatened to cause a scandal at the university if Stefano didn't back off. The printer dispute lasted seven months, during which the supplier cut off credit to the university and refused to service its other printers. 
At one point, Stefano, completely defeated, wrote to Fabricant's boss, Sam Osman, and said, quote, I'm afraid I've had more than enough. Fabricant eventually paid the bill, but only after the university agreed to cover the extended warranty. He also began secretly taping conversations with colleagues, hoping to entrap them into making embarrassing statements about their peers. Despite his threats and abusive behavior, in June of 1990, the engineering department promoted Fabricant to research professor. He was one step removed from a full-time faculty position. Fabricant had been teaching the odd class since 1984, and in their evaluations, students, the department personnel, and faculty committees cited his high-quality research, his book publication, his good teaching performance, and the fact he had already been a professor at the Polytechnic Institute in the USSR. What faculty members didn't know was that Fabricant had lied on his resume. He claimed that from 1970 to 1973, he was a professor. When records show that from 1970 to 1972, he was only an instructor. He was then promoted to assistant professor in 1973 before being fired for abusive behavior. He also lied on his resume when he said he had a doctorate degree in mechanical engineering, which deals with machines and the production of power. His Russian academic records show that his doctorate was in mechanics, a completely different field that's on the basis of physics and astronomy. In addition, his teaching record was not spotless. He received a bad student evaluation for a course he taught in statistics and probability theory at Concordia. But Osman had erased the evaluation from Fabricant's record because it could have damaged his future prospects. Based on his previous evaluations, in September of 1990, the Department Personnel Committee recommended Fabricant be hired as a full-time tenure associate professor. But Rose Shinen opposed the appointment. She felt that Fabricant's personality was completely wrong for Concordia. And she worried about the death threats he had spread around campus. She disliked him personally, and plus she wasn't really impressed by his credentials. She knew how professors worked and could milk one idea into a tank full of publications. And she knew the classes could easily be manipulated to get a good student evaluation. She decided she would try to persuade the mechanical engineering committee members to reverse their recommendation. Disturbed by Fabricant's behavior, she had consulted psychologists to ask whether he posed a threat to the university community. She told the committee this and insisted they reverse their decision, but they refused, saying that Fabricant only behaved badly when he saw a threat to his status as a full-time faculty member. And Sam Osman believed that settling Fabricant's contract problems would only bring out the best in him. Sam Osman resented Shinan's request and believed she was violating the principles of academic freedom, so he stood firm warning her that if she rejected the department's decision, he would later fight it. Secretly, Osman admitted later that he would have been relieved if Rose had refused the recommendation. Of course he did. He didn't want the responsibility of refusing a promotion. It's much easier to pass the buck on to someone else. But Rose didn't want that responsibility either. Fueled by his publication and teaching evaluations, the Fabricant tenure train had gathered too much speed. So, against her own better judgment, Rose approved it, but not before she wrote the following note to Concordia's rector, Patrick Keneff. Quote, My own assessment is that whatever problems we have been presented with by Dr. Fabricant will continue. My gut feeling is telling me he should not be taken on to the full-time faculty at Concordia University. If I approve the appointment, it will therefore be as a rubber stamp. Shinen, however, added conditions to his two-year contract. The first was Fabricant must wait three years before being considered for tenure, and second, his previous years at Concordia would not count for tenure. Fabricant signed his contract in January of 1991. He only had to teach his courses and continue to write his papers, and he would eventually get tenure. The position he had fought so hard to win was now his to lose and he quickly set about doing just that. In the spring of 1991, shortly after he was installed as a full-time associate professor, 
He asked for a four-month paid leave of absence to go to France. Needless to say, he was refused. Then later in the summer of 1991, Fabricant asked if he could use research money to buy release from his teaching. Osman advised Fabricant that using research grant money to pay someone else to teach your courses violated university and federal regulations. Fabricant's two-year contract was due for renewal in June of 1992, when Sam Osman finally decided to do what no one else had done. He examined Fabricant's resumes and found discrepancies between two resumes that Fabricant had submitted since coming to Concordia in 1979. And now he wanted proof of Fabricant's academic credentials. Russia was now much more open since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the documents were available, so he asked Fabricant to obtain them. Of course, he refused to do so, and is quoted as saying, How can a scientist like you ask a scientist like me for proof of my credentials? Eventually, Concordia's general secretary wrote to Osman in January of 1992, demanding he drop his investigation into Fabricant's credentials, saying it was unreasonable and possibly borderline harassment. Well aware that his reappointment was approaching, Fabricant again began hanging around Rose Shinen's office. He sat there alone, doing nothing, just staring at Rose. Not saying a word, just staring. For two hours. Quote, It was off-putting, but other people were there and I couldn't do anything about it. Sam Osmond, in the meantime, wanted to get rid of Fabricant. It was clear to him that Rose was right. Fabricant would never fit in. The Mechanical Engineering Personnel Committee logged more than 30 hours of meetings in late October 1991. Fearful that Fabricant would eavesdrop on the meeting, as he so often did, Sam Osman ordered that his office doors be soundproofed. Oh my god, this guy. At some point, committee members discovered Fabricant loitering outside Osman's office at 11.30 at night. They called security to have him escorted out of the building, but he escaped through the basement. Eventually, the department committee voted not to renew Fabricant's contract, citing his chronic abusive behavior, his repeated attempts to avoid his teaching duties, and his failure to supervise more graduate students. Quote, Many persons inside and outside the university have been subjected to harassment, threats, blackmail, and allegations by Dr. Fabricant. In the fall of 1991, Fabricant took a course in handguns at a basement club in Ville de Saint-Pierre. He passed the course on November 22nd, the day after the Mechanical Engineering Department sent its recommendations to fire Fabricant up to the Engineering Department's Faculty Personnel Committee. After three meetings, the Faculty Personnel Committee overturned the decision, claiming that the Mechanical Engineering Committee concentrated too heavily on his behavior and failed to properly evaluate his research and teaching records. However, the committee criticized Fabricant for not working within the department's research goals, for not supervising more graduate students, for not contributing to curriculum development, and for not teaching any advanced courses in mechanical engineering. Instead of renewing his two-year contract, the faculty committee voted to put him on probation for one year, during which Fabricant was to demonstrate he could satisfy all the committee's concerns. Without realizing it, the committee had Fabricant trapped. He was in danger of being uncovered as a fraud. He was not a mechanical engineer, as he claimed. He had already tried to obtain a transfer to the Department of Mathematics, but was refused. Nobody else wanted him, and admitting he lied on his resume would get him fired. So, in the early new year of 1992, Valerie Fabricant began what would become an international campaign to discredit the university and paint himself as a victim of fraud and corruption on the part of his colleagues. The first six months of 1992 had not been good for Valerie Fabricant. His second book had been a disaster, and the proposal for his third book had been rejected. He was also facing possible dismissal from his job. The engineering department had put him on one-year probation, during which he had to prove that he could teach advanced mechanical engineering courses. 
but it was becoming increasingly clear to his colleagues that Fabricant couldn't teach these courses. Although at first, Fabricant tried to get out of teaching altogether. When department chairman Sam Osman sent a memo to all department professors in November of 1991, asking for their teaching preferences for the next academic year, Fabricant wrote back, no teaching, I'll be on sabbatical next year. Osman thought this was just another attempt to shun his teaching responsibilities, telling him he doesn't have permission to take sabbatical nor the right to one. Fabricant felt cornered, and his only refuge seemed to be the internet, which was in its infancy in the early 90s. It had only about 15 million users worldwide, but growing rapidly, with 1 million new users each month. For six months, he sent a buttload of memos and letters and reports with claims of corruption to fellow scientists at Concordia and around the world. So keep in mind, this was the early 90s, so if you had the internet, you were on a dial-up system. High speed wasn't a thing back then. Wi-Fi wasn't a thing back then. If you had the internet, it was slow. So when Fabricant published lengthy delusions to the scientific community in high volume, it caused a huge backup in McGill's email system. McGill's IT department even begged Fabricant to stop. Because he had a tendency to repeat a programming error that sent 45 copies of the same letter to the same place. But Fabricant couldn't admit he made a mistake and announced that McGill was part of a conspiracy to make him look crazy. He described it as an old communist trick. While some scientists just dismissed his postings as an idiot rambling, he did have supporters, believe it or not. Disgruntled students and some professors jumped on his bandwagon. And unknown to Concordia, Fabricant also redoubled his efforts he started in 1990 to purchase a handgun. In February of 1992, he secured a gun permit for target shooting. And then, on March 11, 1992, he went to W.S. Avenue International and bought his first handgun. It was described by the shop owner as a lady gun and said that it was too small and too inaccurate for target shooting. Concordia's winter semester ended in April of 1992, and Fabricant spent part of May marking first-year dynamic courses that had been taught by him and three other professors. Each professor was given a number of questions to mark. When Fabricant added up his students' marks and the registrar posted the results, the trouble began. The final marks were issued in late May, and it wasn't long before students started complaining, but these weren't your usual type of complaints. Students didn't complain about their own marks. They complained about other students' marks, and those marks had been given by Fabricant. They complained that fellow students who hadn't answered the questions correctly received better marks than they did. After receiving about 20 complaints, Sam Osman grew concerned, so he collected all the exam books from the professors and gave them to an outside consultant to analyze. Fabricant grew concerned. Several times he tried to find out from Elizabeth Horwood, Sam Osman's secretary, why the exam books were recalled. The consultant, who was a mechanical engineer and whose identity was kept secret, filed his report in July of 1992, and his analysis of the marking revealed some startling facts. The first was Fabricant had marked wrong answers correct for his students, and when Fabricant added up the students' scores, he falsely bumped up the marks 12 to 20 percent. Osman didn't receive the consultant's report until late July of 1992, and his superior, Dean Swamy, was out of town, so Osman was unable to discuss it with him. Several days after Swamy returned, the shooting took place, so Fabricant was never confronted about the report. He knew that Osman intended to have the papers marked again, and must have been worried that he would be found out. In June of 1992, Fabricant also received his teaching assignments for the 92-93 academic year, and it wasn't good news. He was assigned four courses, two of which were computer design courses, one at the graduate level. Fabricant knew nothing about computer design or creating software, even begging Osmond to be reassigned, but Osmond stood firm, 
telling him every mechanical engineering professor must know how to teach this course. In August of 1992, one week before the killing spree, Fabricant went to court to seek an injunction against the university. He wanted the court to tell Concordia to cancel his teaching assignments and to grant him an immediate sabbatical. In his motion, he claimed that he was a, quote, world-class scientist on the verge of an important scientific discovery. Early in the morning of June 24, 1992, Fabricant approached the engineering faculty secretary, Elizabeth Horwood, to demand she sign his application to carry a gun. Fabricant needed five signatures. The thought of Fabricant with a gun terrified his colleagues. And Vice Rector Services Charles Bertrand quickly wrote up a memo for his superiors. This time, the university had to act and suspend Fabricant's employment. The memo read, quote, It is our recommendation that he be immediately suspended with pay from the university. In our opinion, Dr. Fabricant presents an immediate and continuing threat to the members of the university community as set forth in Article 2907 of the Collective Agreement. As a condition for reinstatement in the university, Dr. Fabricant must be required to produce a statement from a psychiatrist chosen by the university attesting to his mental stability. Charles Bertrand rushed to get this memo typed up and sent to rector Patrick Keneff before the holiday long weekend began. Bertrand was sure that Keneff would agree to block Fabricant from the school. When Bertrand headed down the street to Keneff's office on June 23rd, Fabricant was in an agitated, even panicky state. He feared he could be unmasked for fraudulent exam markings and his inability to teach more advanced mechanical engineering courses. Bertrand wanted to send Fabricant a strong message. Quote, I wanted to say we're fed up with your intimidation and your harassment, and we're not going to put up with it anymore. But Bertrand's meeting with Keneff did not go as planned. Keneff categorically refused to suspend Fabricant. He felt legally that he didn't have enough proof that Fabricant was a threat, which absolutely stunned Bertrand. Over the last year, Bertrand had heard professors and secretaries complain that Fabricant had threatened them with violence. The faculty union offices had even purchased video surveillance cameras because they feared Fabricant might get violent during his frequent unannounced visits. The vice rector academic had ordered guard stations around her door whenever Fabricant was around. Concordia had also hired armed security to protect the rector and several others. One university administrator installed a panic button in his office. And the dean of engineering had posted a guard at his door, fearing that Fabricant might attack or even kill him. And still, Kenneth didn't think they had enough proof to take solid action against Fabricant. So he sent a letter to Grendon Haynes, the in-house consultant who acted as the middleman with university issues and the man who tried to help Fabricant back in 1989. The letter asked Haynes if he had any information that could support a letter to police requesting that Fabricant not be given a gun permit. Because of a screw-up, that letter didn't arrive to Haynes until July 25th, one month later. But he did reply within five days of receiving the letter. In his reply, he discussed his meetings with Fabricant and the death threats. Sadly, though, his reply was too late, and the rector had already sent his reply to the police. But nobody bothered to check the fine print of the application Fabricant wanted Elizabeth Horwood to sign. That application was to transport a gun, not to purchase one. In other words, Fabricant already owned a gun. He was also unable to find anyone in his faculty willing to sign his application. On July 14, 1992, Fabricant asked Kenneth to co-sign. The vector's reply was a huge, bold-faced no, printed over one letter-sized page. One week later, Fabricant's wife, Maya, filed a request with the police for a permit to purchase a Smith & Wesson 38 Special and a Bursa 765 for target practice. She told the Montreal Gazette that she chose these guns from Century International Arms Limited, a Montreal gun wholesaler, because they were small and light. And then on August 6th, 
The same day Fabricon had been forcefully reprimanded by Faculty Association Union President Michael Hogbin, she ordered the guns and paid for the weapons three days before the killings with cash and carried them home. Fabricant would hide them in a suitcase to keep them away from the children. It was during these next few weeks that Fabricant's neighbors became worried about him. When he wanted to relax, Fabricant was apparently fond of playing the piano. His neighbors enjoyed his playing so much that when he stopped, the neighbors called to make sure he was okay. Maya assured them that he was fine, but the truth was she was concerned about his health and his mental state. Several neighbors witnessed him pacing around the outdoor pool for hours on August 23rd. Maya would later tell friends that he paced up and down the apartment that night with a blank fixed gaze mumbling, my life is finished, my life is finished. On August 24th, Fabricant met with Union President Michael Hogbin at 3 p.m. in Fabricant's office. What took place at this meeting is unknown, but at one point Hogbin pulled out a letter he had written to Fabricant informing him that because of his harassment of Union employees, he was not to speak to anyone else in the Union office except Hogbin, and only by appointment. About 10 minutes went by, and then three shots rang out. They were heard by Professor Jan Saber, who was across the hall in his office on the phone to his wife, and with him was graduate student Peter Lawn, although at the time he didn't know they were gunshots. He thought the noise was coming from construction workers who were working on the 10th floor and that the noise was a staple gun. He was annoyed but didn't shut the door to his office and resumed the conversation with his wife. Inside Fabricant's office, Hogbin lay dying, and Fabricant pushed his body aside so he could open the door. Jan Saber was still on the phone with his wife when Fabricant came through the open door with a gun in each hand, and saying nothing, he shot Saber once in the head and once in the stomach. Hearing the shots and the commotion, Saber's wife became frantic and called 911. She already suspected it was Fabricant. She had warned her husband not to get involved in his disputes and to stay away from him. He was dangerous. As Fabricant walked down the corridor, he saw Elizabeth Horwood coming towards him. He shot her, and although she was hit in the leg, she managed to run inside her office and slam the door, knowing that it would lock automatically. Fabricant then left the mechanical engineering department towards the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Students and professors who saw him barricaded themselves in offices and called security. Professors Otto Schwelb and Faiva Saigoa had been chatting in Zayoga's office for more than an hour when Valerie Fabricant came through an open door, raised his pistol, and shot Zayoga point blank. Except Zayoga was still standing, but after being shot, he fell towards Fabricant and grabbed him, dragging him to the floor. Otto Schwelb grabbed Fabricant by his jacket and pulled him out of the office. In the scuffle, one of Fabricant's guns and his glasses fell to the floor. Schwelb tried to barricade him inside the office, but Fabricant's leg stuck out across the door jamb. He mistakenly thought that Fabricant had been disarmed, not realizing that he had two palm-sized pistols in his pockets. Fabricant next made his way to Dean Swamy's office. Swami was having coffee with two other colleagues, Professor Matthew Douglas and Professor Terry Fancott, when a secretary, Susan Altima, came running in and warned them that Fabricant had a gun and shot Horwood. Swami immediately went into his office, called security and 911. He told Susan Altima to stay put, but she ignored him and immediately went back to help Horwood. Fancott and Douglas went out to the reception area and warned students to get out of the building, and then Fancott left the dean's office. Fabricant suddenly came into the dean's reception area. At that moment, Douglas came out of a conference room, raised his hands, and said, quote, Hold on, let's talk about this. Fabricant responded by shooting Douglas three times. He then left the dean's office and headed back towards Sam Osmond's office in the mechanical engineering department. Inside Osmond's locked office, Horwood and Susan Altima felt secure. They were on the phone with 911, 
when suddenly security guard Daniel Martin opened the door with a key and came into the office with Professor George Abdu. Martin took the phone from Horwood and began speaking to 911. She was about to sit down when she saw Fabricant coming through an open door. He pointed a gun at her and fired. Horwood and Ultima managed to escape through a side door, but then Fabricant locked the doors and took Professor Abdo and Martin hostage. He took the phone from Martin and told 911 he had just committed several murders and wanted to talk to a television reporter to explain his killing spree to the public. Fabricant hung on for about an hour until he put the gun down to adjust the phone. Abdo kicked the gun far out of Fabricant's reach and Martin jumped on him. The killing spree was over, but it didn't take long for the world to find out Concordia University administration failed to listen to repeated warnings from faculty members that Valerie Fabricant was a danger to both them and the university community. However bad as it was though, it could have been much worse. Lessons learned from the École Polytechnique massacre in 1989 allowed Montreal's emergency response network to move quickly following the shootings. 911 received a call about the shooting at 314. Just one minute later, 20 officers were dispatched to the Henry F. Hall building, and the first squad cars arrived on the scene at 317. On August 25, 1992, Valerie Fabricant was arrested on two counts of first-degree murder, three counts of attempted murder, three counts of kidnapping, two counts of uttering death threats, two counts of possession of a restricted firearm, and one count of using a firearm in the commission of a crime. By August 26, those charges would increase to three charges of first-degree murder, as sadly, Aaron Jan Saber, age 46, succumbed to his wounds. Staying true to form, Fabricant remained as difficult in the courtroom as he did in the workplace. At his first court appearance, he represented himself. And he told the judge that he wanted to waive his right to a preliminary hearing and go straight to trial. But Quebec court judge Gil Cadeau refused, advising him to consult with a lawyer before making such an important decision. Fabricant also filed a motion in Superior Court to improve the conditions of his detention as he was acting as his own attorney. Those necessities included a computer, a laser printer, a telephone, a filing cabinet, cassette recorder, and the freedom to come and go to the court as he pleases to file legal documents or gain access to legal text. But a Quebec Superior Court judge put his foot down and said no. Quote, you have absolutely no special rights and this court will certainly not intervene in the day-to-day -day operations of Parthenay Detention Center. His requests for a laser printer and computer were also denied. At this point, Fabricant had only been in jail for about a month, but he knew he didn't like it. He complained to the judge that although he was the perpetrator of the crime he was being accused of, his right to life, liberty, and security of the persons as guaranteed by the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms was being violated. He complained that the holding cells in the courthouse were too smoky and said he could not talk on the telephone freely and could not search for witnesses. He also complained about a toothache and said he needed to see a dentist and asked the judge to order that he receives hot meals for dinner after court appearances. The judge refused both, saying that he doesn't have jurisdiction over the detention center. About a week later, Fabricant said he changed his mind and said that he now wanted a preliminary hearing, saying that he needed to hear what eyewitnesses have to say because he doesn't remember all that happened that day. And then on September 23rd, almost one month after the shooting, Foivo Sayoga, age 48, chairman of Concordia University's Electrical and Computer Engineering Department, died of his injuries and Valerie Fabricant was charged with an additional charge of first-degree murder. The preliminary hearing was a bit of a shit show because Fabricant insisted on acting as his own attorney. And when he cross-examined witnesses, he often ridiculed and laughed at them. He had a legal aid lawyer assisting him, but this arrangement lasted less than a month when Fabricant abruptly fired him, saying he was disloyal and gave bad advice. Even the lawyer wanted out of the arrangement, telling the judge he was fed up with the abuse. 
Fabricant continued to delay and drag out the preliminary hearing until January of 1993, when Quebec Superior Court Justice John Hannon reached his breaking point and set a trial date of March 8th that year. He would plead not guilty to the murders and the trial dragged on for four and a half months, with him getting kicked out of the courtroom multiple times for arguing with the judge. It would be one of the longest trials in Canadian history, and it was as bizarre as ridiculously long, full of contempt charges and legal wranglings. In total, Fabricant went through 10 lawyers to assist him while he attempted to defend himself. Some were fired because he viewed them as traitors, and then others just couldn't deal with him. They just, they couldn't. In total, he was cited six times for contempt of court. He called the judge everything you can think of, from a little old crook to the presiding Muppet. I'm sorry, that's funny. Even if he was acquitted of the murder charges, he would still have to serve two years and three months for contempt. His defense was basically Concordia University provoked him into violence by abusing him. After deliberating for almost seven hours, the jury found him guilty of all four murders and the attempted murder of Secretary Elizabeth Horwood and holding another professor, George Abdo, and security guard Daniel Martin hostage. He would be sentenced to life with the possibility of parole after serving 25 years. In a written statement from Justice Fraser Martin, quote, Your actions that day defy comprehension. You are a warped, twisted, and deeply troubled man. Your credentials firmly establish you as a vicious murderer, a wretched man puffed up by the power of a gun to an artificial giant. In the aftermath of the shooting and the trial, the university commissioned two independent committees of inquiry, to investigate aspects of the mass shooting. It also established a task force to work on internal policy and procedure. The independent review was conducted by John Scott Cowan, former faculty association president and former vice president of the University of Ottawa. He was commissioned to study Fabricant's employment history and related human resources issues at Concordia University. In addition, he identified problems common to university environments, where disruptive behavior has sometimes been excused under the mantle of academic freedom, and because many of the academics involved had little experience as managers. He pointed out that often academic instructors were not comfortable as managers and needed additional training. In 2016, Fabricant would apply for and be denied parole. He would be denied again in 2020. At his most recent parole hearing, Fabricant not only continues to believe that people at Concordia University plotted against him, but he's added a new twist to his delusions. He compares his situation to that of Jeffrey Epstein. At his most recent parole hearing, the Parole Board of Canada wrote, quote, you felt like your life was in jeopardy and that you had to protect yourself against a lasting plot involving Quebec's chief justice, teachers, and several psychiatrists. You consider that you acted in self-defense. During your hearing, you reiterated that your position that your life was being threatened and wanted to combat threats with threats. You maintain you believe the plan was for you to be incarcerated for a year and implied that you would be killed in prison. So that's where we are at this point. Valerie Fabricant is still incarcerated and I don't really see a world where he'll ever be released. He's in his 80s now, but he hasn't changed. He's still as arrogant as ever. And even though he's in prison, he's still publishing papers. Between 1996 and 2021, Valerie Fabricant has published nearly 60 scientific papers in more than a dozen journals, and he's done it all from prison. He even has a LinkedIn account that I stumbled across accidentally. I'm not sure how that works because inmates in Canada don't have internet access. So someone's obviously helping him out with that. Most recently in 2020, he attempted to launch a lawsuit against Corrections Canada over kosher prison food, specifically kosher soup. In a statement of claim, he says that until December 2017, he was served kosher soup every day. 
He stopped getting kosher soup at that time, while other inmates continued to get soup regularly. He also complained that in August 2019, the prison system changed its kosher food supplier, and that the new food is either unappetizing to the point of being inedible, or the portion sizes are much smaller than the non-kosher dishes served to non-Jewish inmates, and less than Canadian prisons' portion guidelines. His latest lawsuit didn't go over very well with the judge overseeing the case, and Justice David Strada ruled that Valerie Fabricant unduly wastes the resources of other people in the court through the many legal procedures he's initiated from behind bars, and declared him a vexatious litigant, which basically means he needs to get permission before filing any more lawsuits. If Fabricant is still alive, his next parole hearing will be three years from now, in 2025. A permanent memorial commemorating the four professors who were killed that day sits now in the lobby of the Hall building where the shootings took place. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed learning about this case, please be sure to like and subscribe. If there's a case you'd like me to cover, please be sure to let me know in the comment section down below. Thanks again, and I will see you next time.